Meeting to order. September 9th, 2020, regular meeting of the Shirts Planning and Zoning Commission. Item number two, seat alternates. Mr. Odom, if you would, please. Thank you, sir. Item three, hearing of residents. Did anyone sign up? No one signed up. All right, but we do have um, one that was emailed in. Three minutes. <laughs> I'll try to get it done in three minutes. Okay. And I'll leave it up to your discussion. How I, you know, we, I don't think we need to read the attachments and all that kind of, but I'll leave that up to you. Okay. So this was emailed in from John Sullivan at 513 Triple Crown. Sheriff's Planning and Zoning Commission. I watched the last PNZ meeting and I wish I could have been there to clarify. Unfortunately, my concerns were not clear. My primary focus is not the current charter school and I do not live in Riata. My primary concern is that we allow a business to recklessly cut down protected trees in our community without any repercussions and then configure their site plan without regard for the current landscape. Additionally, the business can go ahead and put up a parking lot without the proper shade tree requirements. That alone allows more parking spaces on a smaller lot with less shade, which in itself is an unfair business advantage over private schools. Having less trees along a major arterial or even expressway such as Interstate 35 frontage is particularly concerning. Shade trees are great for cooling their, cooling their environment, not only by shading the black asphalt and reducing surface absorption heating during the day, but also in transpiration, cooling through their leaves. This is significant in shirts for most of the year. Additionally, shade trees are able to filter pollution from the traffic in industrial areas, such as the major interstates and large quarries northwest of Schertz. Trees also are useful for helping to block traffic noise, among other beautification and livability concerns. There are important issues that were overlooked with the most recent approved charter school site. I'm confident that will not be the last charter school to be built in our city, especially once national organizations realize we are so generous with tree mitigation and site planning. What will happen when a charter school wants to build on a heavily wooded lot with protected oak trees and they decide to clear cut for a building and parking lot on another small lot? This could even occur on a larger lot for a high school building and student parking needs. At a minimum, I think we should remove the exemptions for tree mitigation on these small lot schools with a lack of open space, but I would like to see the tree requirement exemption along arterials and in parking lots be removed as well. While I am not sure these exemptions are necessary for any school, I am positive they do not make sense for charter schools. With all due respect, school financing in Texas is far too complicated to be discussed in a PNZ public hearing, and there were, too, there were many inaccuracies stated in the last meeting. It does not have to be complicated for our purposes, though. I do not understand why staff is trying to make charter schools appear to be like public schools, because they are very, very different creatures from a public accountability, and especially from a planning perspective. I understand the city is defending a previous position, but planning staff do not completely understand the nuances between charter and public schools. That is not their job, so that makes sense. Besides, most of the state does not understand the school finance formula, let alone the differences with charter schools. I also should point out that many private schools are nonprofit as well. We don't make broad tree exemptions for nonprofits in the UDC or else churches and many others would be included. Here is a critical difference between public ISD and charter school facilities when it comes to city planning. Public ISD facilities are 100% taxpayer funded. Locally, this has even involved a public bond election for any new school buildings that is voted on yes or no by local taxpayers. There is very specific ballot language required for new school buildings and land purchases. New ISD schools go through extensive local vetting with local communities made of parents, teachers, school admin, community members, elected leaders, etc. There are many opportunities to voice concerns with a facility and its impacts on the community, and there are elected leaders to hold accountable. This process often takes multiple years of planning, public planning, and then construction can also take multiple years as well. Charter schools are built with private dollars generated from varying sources and often go up in less than a year with minimal planning and usually no public involvement. Sometimes there are federal grants, but I'm not aware of state or local taxpayer funding involved in building any local charter schools. After charter schools are built, they can receive similar state funding for students, but even that is a different formula that does not involve local taxpayer oversight. Regardless how a school budget is funded after the school is built should not be a factor in our UDC, especially for shade tree requirements. The planning and building of these facilities, which is what we are considering with our UDC exemptions, are two completely different processes from an accountability and planning perspective. 
One is more similar to any other business coming to Schertz, and the other is more rigorous process than our own PNZ commission. This is why city staff told PNZ, city council, and Schertz citizens that we already have plenty of checks and balances when, public, when building public schools so we could exempt them from many UNIC requirements. If you want to hear that comment, I am positive it could be found in the videos from PNZ and council when the UDC amendment was brought up in 2016-2017. That was a critical selling point for me when these exemptions were initially passed. I had trouble finding these meetings on YouTube or I would have reviewed them to find the exact quotes. However, my recollection is pretty clear because I thought it was odd that we would allow exemptions for schools in the first place. Further, charter schools boards are appointed, not elected. And then he indicates that that's directly from the TEA website, which you can see there. This is important to understand because once a school is built, there is no local public accountability process for charter schools. Good luck to anyone attempting to work with most charter schools on any concerns, even if you are a parent with a student in attendance, let alone as any random neighboring citizen with no business relationship to the school. The city will work with these schools just as they would a local business. Many charter schools know that if you do not like the school, you can go to a public school and you are no longer a bother to them. Some bank on that to their advantage. I am involved in my son's charter school and I could not tell you who is on their board. Those boards, if they even meet regularly, are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations, especially with large statewide charter districts. Most likely, they are not local. Also, just because a charter school allows any students from the area to apply, it doesn't mean they are set up to serve our community in shirts, and it doesn't mean they won't weed out kids by pressure of charging extra fees for everything, aggressively fundraise for teacher salaries, etc. The fact that most charter schools do not offer transportation and hot school lunches alone limit who will apply. My oldest son will be graduating from a charter school this year and has attended sixth grade since sixth grade, so I'm very familiar with the differences. I have a lot more insight to provide on these differences if you are interested in learning more. Back to the issues. I don't buy the security concerns for the tree exemptions. Security concerns and the rollout of the exemptions were tied mostly to the building and fencing exemptions, which no longer are relevant. Shade trees are not bushes that block views like a fence, even on an island in parking lots. If it is a concern that trees if it is a concern, the trees can be trimmed up as they mature, as was brought up in the last meeting. Why are we not concerned with the security of private school children as well, if that is the reasoning? More importantly, security is not the primary reason we were given about the tree mitigation and parking lot trees exemptions in 2016-2017. As you can see from the memo below, the primary reasoning was because public schools are large sites and already have large recreational areas, so it is a burden to require them to comply with tree mitigation and landscaping requirements when they already have vast open space areas for recreation and buffers. This is exactly the opposite of what we are seeing with current exemptions given to charter schools on small lots with no open space, not even a recreational field. Also, we, also are we also able to use city tree preservation funds on charter school properties as implied here, which you can see in this section. Again, these charter school sites are very small compared to the public school sites envisioned with these UDC exemptions. I understand that we now have many new planning staff and PNZ members since 2017, so all of this was decided with different people, but it's important to be consistent in our reasoning from a public perception standpoint. I am now just as concerned with our city's consistency and reasoning of policies as I am with, these, with the exemptions themselves. Unfortunately, I think this is a sort of change in reasoning undermines the public's trust in city government. I hope I was able to provide more clarity than confusion here, but I'm not so sure. Thank you for taking the time to understand the concerns. Thank you. And that was the only one we had, correct? Yeah. All right, uh, moving on to item four, consent agenda. We have uh, three items on the consent agenda tonight. Item A, minutes for the August 26, 2020 regular meeting. Item B, PC 2018-027 EXT, consider and act upon a request for approval for a time extension for the preliminary plat of the Homestead Subdivision Unit 7, an approximately 27-acre tract of land generally located approximately 380 feet east of the intersection of Crockett Cove and Winkler Trail, Guadalupe County, Texas. And item C, PC 2018-028 EXT, consider and act upon a request for approval for a time extension for the preliminary plat of the Homestead Subdivision Unit 10 an approximate 14-acre tract of land generally located approximately 1,100 
feet east of the intersection of Crockett Cove and Winkler Trail, Guadalupe County, Texas. Commissioners, do any of these three items need to be pulled for discussion? If not, Chair will entertain a motion. Chair, make a motion. We uh, approve the minutes and uh, two extensions as presented. Second. Commissioner Broad, was that you? Yes, thank you. Well, I was looking that way, and as soon as I turned away. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented from Commissioner Greenwald and a second from Commissioner Broad. There's no discussion on the consent agenda. Call for the vote. Aye. 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 That's uh, seven ayes, none opposed. Motion passes. Item number five. A public hearing. The Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing related to zone change requests and replats. Uh, we have one item, ZC 2020-006. Hold a public hearing, consider and make a recommendation to City Council on a request to rezone approximately 204 acres of land from General Business District and Manufacturing Light District to Plan Development District located southwest of Greytown Road stretching between Interstate Highway 10 and Bainig Drive, City of Shirts, Bear County, Texas, also known as Bear County Property Identification Numbers 619201 and 619202. For those in the audience, the way we handle the, uh, the public hearing is staff will provide us with a presentation on the application and we'll give the, um, the applicant, after that we'll give the applicant an opportunity to uh, present any comments if they wish, and then we'll open it for uh, public input, and then we'll uh, discuss it uh, here on the on the dais. So, Nick, go ahead. Good evening, Commissioners. Nick Copier, uh, City of Shirts Planning Division. Uh, like Commissioner Allah said, uh, this is a zone change for around 200 acres uh, from General Business District and Manufacturing Light District to Plan Development District. So, first off. Just for your reference, uh, this is the subject property outlined in green. Um, kind of reference boundaries, this is Interstate Highway 10, this is Greytown Road, Bainig Drive, uh, Senior Lake Drive. Um, the subject properties uh, go all the way from uh, I-10 to Bainig Drive along Greytown, excluding the two hard corners here, I-10 and Greytown, and Bainig and Greytown. As part of the zone change public hearing, we sent out uh, notice mailers to all the surrounding property owners within 200 feet. Uh, I believe 31 of them, uh, including all of these. Uh, so far, we've gotten three official responses back, two in favor uh, and one opposed, which are the notices you were handed before the meeting began. Uh, this is a copy of our current zoning map. So as you can see, uh, the subject property is currently zoned manufacturing light, uh, this darker gray color and general business district. Um, it is adjacent uh, to three uh, thoroughfares here, Greytown, Bainig, and I-10. Um, it is surrounded by uh, two primary kind of uses. So single family residential agricultural here across from Greytown uh, in these neighborhoods like uh, the Reserve, Laura Heights, and then also outside of the city limits across Bainig Drive here in the city of San Antonio. It's also used for single family residential. And then there's uh, large portions of undeveloped or agricultural land here to the west and to the south of the subject properties that are zone manufacturing light and general business district as well. So what you're looking at with the same sort of scope is the uh, comprehensive land use plan for the city. Uh, this is the uh, Southern Shirts sector plan. As you can see, most of the area here uh, is designated as a state neighborhood, which is this lighter beige kind of tan color um, with some areas along the major intersections for the highway designated as highway commercial. Um, and then this blue hatch you're seeing is the uh, FEMA floodplain data. So the estate neighborhood land use designation uh, that's intended to address most of the residential developments uh, and the patterns we see with those in Southern Shirts uh, by requiring a minimum lot size of uh, 0.5 acres, so two dwelling units per acre as the density for that zoning district. So 
properties within this specific land use designation kind of have two options for development. One, go with the corresponding zoning district, uh, which is the single family residential agricultural zoning district, which is what you'd see across Greytown from here. Or two, go with the estate neighborhood plan development district, um, which is an alternative development option that uh, mandates an equivalent overall density of the RA zoning district, so what you'd see here. So the only difference in how the density is calculated is for the RA zoning district, it's uh, two dwelling units per acre and it's per lot, so it's a minimum one half acre per lot for an ENPDD, and we have other ones in the city, think of like Halley's Cove, something like that. For an ENPDD, the density is calculated on an overall uh, subdivision level, so as long as the overall density is commensurate to the two dwelling units per acre, uh, that is the other development option. The Greytown Plan Development District uh, is going to follow the regulations of the uh, State Neighborhood Plan Development District with one modification. Uh, some of the benefits you'll see for the EMPDD is it'll allow for uh, flexible residential clustering options, um, which would reduce infrastructure costs um, and kind of allow for a more creative utilization or placement of the homes on the subject property. Uh, and it still just achieves the same overall density as that RA zoning district. Um, the Greytown PDD will is proposing to continue with that max density requirement of two dwelling units per acre, um, but it is also requesting to reduce the minimum open space requirement from the, the standard 50% that you would see in Unified Development Code Section 21513, which kind of lists the uh, sample requirements, if you will, to 41% uh, to primarily allow for the development of these larger lots, um, which kind of brings to the next point of the development standards is the uh, dimensional requirements. So the EMPDD sample standards in the UC do not address lot size. So what, what could realistically happen with an EMPDD is as long as you meet the overall two dwelling units per acre, the lot sizes you could, you could kind of break up as you see fit as long as the overall density makes it. So with the Greytown PDD, the overall density is going to stay at two dwelling units per acre. It's proposed to stay at two dwelling units per acre. However, they're going to establish two uh, basically lot categories, the SF80 and the SF100. Um, for the SF80, it's a minimum area of 10,400 square feet with a minimum width of 80 and a minimum, width of de a minimum depth of 130. And for the SF100, it is uh, the same depth with 100 feet wide, so 13,000 square feet as the minimum area. Um, another requirement here is that the overall development of the Greytown subdivision must include at least 50% of those SF100 lots. So what that means is that at a bare minimum, you're seeing uh, an average lot size of 11,700 square feet or 90 by 130, uh, which is larger than any single family residential zoning district outside of their agricultural designation. So what would that look like? Um, this is the conceptual plan submitted with Greytown that would kind of show how these zoning regulations could be applied to their subject properties. So what you'd see is the key points of what I was talking about with an EMPDD, the kind of clustering of the residences outside of these large swaths of open space that kind of allow the uh, natural condition of those areas to remain, um, as well as open space kind of dispersed throughout the rest of the subdivision and different key areas as well. Um, and again, what you'd see is reduced infrastructure with those lots clustered to certain areas. So to kind of talk about the open space a little bit more, so 41% for a, for a property of this size, or for properties of this size, would equate to 84 and a half acres, roughly. So 43 and a half of those acres are proposed to be dedicated as a public park, uh, 10 acres, 10 and a half acres outside the floodplain, and 33 within it. So outside of the floodplain, the developer's proposing uh, a number of passive uh, and active improvements to the public park, um, such as a playscape or playground, pavilion, parking lot, restrooms, a baseball field backstop, and a pedestrian pathway. And then inside the floodplain, you have the preservation of those two large ponds or lakes uh, in their natural condition. The remaining 41 acres of private space, or sorry, of open space will be private, um, not public park. It'll, I mean, primarily it'll, it serves to connect the homes from the main park area uh, to, or sorry, connect other homes to the main park area through these open space corridors. It'll maintain these drainage channels, and it'll also buffer the single family residences from the thoroughfares. Uh, the Parks Board, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board accepted uh, the proposed Greytown Park that was submitted uh, before them on August 24th, 2020. To kind of give you kind of an overview of what uh, they're thinking conceptual park-wise, so this is the overlay of their conceptual plan uh, with the park. 
So this is the main uh, open space area that's going to be dedicated as park. Uh, this, this yellow area is what you'd see um, as the kind of improvement area, those active and passive improvements. Uh, you can see the two uh, lakes or ponds being preserved here in uh, the floodplain area of the park. We're going to zoom in right here on this area for the next slide is uh, phase one for the improvements of what I was talking about with the playscape, there's the pedestrian walkway, parking lot, things like that. Um, but that's what they're proposing for inside of those specific open space requirements. The other development standard that is being proposed to change, there's only one additional one, is regarding signs. So the maximum number and maximum height of subdivision entry signs and the maximum number and maximum duration of installment for development signs. I think the easiest way to do this is just from a straight table. Um, what's the regulation, or sorry, what is the code section, what's our current regulation, and what are they proposing? So for the maximum height of the subdivision entry signs, it's currently six feet. What they're proposing is six feet, unless it's incorporated into a masonry wall that would already be required, such as like along a thoroughfare. In that case, it could be within that wall, and the maximum height would be eight feet. An example would be like on Ashley Place here. Um, you can see that the, the subdivision entry sign is incorporated, and it's a little dark, it's from Google Maps, is incorporated into that masonry wall and would be the height of that sign. Um, the other one for subdivision entry signs here is that they have one sign at the primary entrance uh, and then one sign per secondary entrance with a max of 75% area. And they're proposing to have one sign per entrance on Greytown Road, so there's three entrances, entrances they have proposed there. Um, and then two per entrance if it's incorporated into the wall, like you can see here with Ashley Place, they would have the signs incorporated into both sides of that masonry wall as you enter. So I hope this kind of helps. I know it's a little hard to understand exactly what it was meaning. Um, for the development signs, what they have current, what is the current regulation is one sign per entry with two total, and they're proposing one sign per entry with four total. Uh, the max duration of the development signs here um, so they can be installed after the final plat approval, but must be removed after a maximum of three years. And what they're proposing is the same installation date, but must be removed after a max of 10 years following the recordation of the first plat. So the difference is how long they're staying up, not necessarily when they're being installed there. So those are the entire proposed changes uh, within the development standards to any sort of current unified development code standards. Uh, with that, Staff is recommending approval of the proposed, change, proposed zone change to plan development districts. Um, the proposed rezone will actually uh, bring these subject properties into conformance with the comprehensive land use plan, moving their zoning from general business district and manufacturing to uh, an EMPDD, which is suited for the estate neighborhood land use designation within the Southern Shirts sector plan. Um, it'll allow for that balance of maintaining open space, still just a still 41% of the open space preserved on the site, including that large swath in its natural condition, uh, balanced with those larger lots that have been seen to be desirable among uh, you know, larger residential subdivisions that have been brought forth in the past. Um, the proposed public park and open space was uh, accepted by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board when they met in late August, and staff thinks it would fit uh, right in with the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. And the proposed zone change should have a minimal impact on the existing and potential adjacent land uses that are proposed uh, with that future comp plan. I know the applicant is here and does have a presentation uh, to give after mine as well. Thank you. All right. Is that yours? Is that it? Yes. Okay. Yes, and you, the applicant would like to uh, make a presentation? And if you would, please do state your name and address for the record. Yes, Nick, you want to? Hello, uh, my name is David Rittenhouse. I work with Denton Communities. We're a local real estate developer in San Antonio. And um, we put together a presentation on the track. Um, and uh, I guess a lot of this is uh, maybe repetitive from what Nick um, very comprehensively uh, laid out a few minutes ago, so forgive me if that's the case, but just wanted to run through that for you so you have all the information. Um, I guess what you see as far as the, the cover page um, there is one of the lakes on the track. 
uh, just to give you an idea uh, of what it looks like. I know that image is a little stretched out on the screen, uh, but that it does give you an idea of one of the lakes that would be used as an amenity uh, on the track and the foliage around there. Uh, as mentioned before, we're Denton Communities. We're out of San Antonio. Um, we're a 70-year-old uh, company. We do projects in San Antonio and the surrounding areas. Um, that's a list of some of our projects that we've done in the past. Um, I won't go through them uh, and, and bore you with them, but uh, just FYI for your, for your information. Uh, location of Greytown Valley, I know Nick already covered this, but um, uh, obviously the track is 222 approximate acres. Uh, it is located within that red boundary there on the aerial. Um, you will see Laura Heights Estates uh, or the reserve at Shirts kind of to the northeast of the track on the opposite side of Greytown Road. Um, to the uh, due east, uh, you see I-10 East. Uh, you'll see Loop 1604 kind of to the uh, lower left corner of that image. And then you have um, other developments on the other side of Banding Road that are in the city of San Antonio as well. Uh, master plan, I know we went over this as well. Uh, basically within the uh, 222 acres, you have um, the lots in two different pods. Those are the 100 foot lots in the bigger pod, the 80 foot wide lots in the smaller pod. You have the large uh, open space in the middle. Um, you have two commercial tracks on each corner of I-10 and Greytown and Bainig and Greytown Roads. Um, and I'll go into the specifics in just a, a few slides. Zoning map, um, basically this shows within that pink outline what we are um, proposing to rezone. Uh, basically everything that's uh, within that pink boundary is single family residential. Um, and you'll notice the two general business uh, commercial tracks on either corner uh, that are existing as that uh, that zoning classification in our remaining so and not part of the rezone to the EMPDD. Uh, acreage map, we put together a map that basically um, color codes different acreages uh, on the track. Obviously the whole track is 222 acres. Um, what you see in green is the uh, basically the park area uh, which is approximately 43 acres. That's what was approved um, the other week by the Parks Board. Um, in red, we uh, identified what will be the detention basins um, on the track. Obviously, detention is required within the City of Shirts Code. Um, and so um, we wanted to show on there where that oversized area would be. That amounts to about nine acres. Um, obviously, you see in white uh, the roads and lots. In blue are the two commercial tracks. Uh, in kind of the orangey color uh, is more um, open space. Uh, just a summary of um, numbers here uh, as far as the development program is concerned. Again, you have approximately 222 acres on the entire track. Uh, 204 of those acres are proposed as the residential portion. Um, the remaining consists of the two commercial tracks which, which total 18 approximate acres. Um, total number of lots, uh, we're looking at 300. Uh, the total number of lots per acre is 1.47. Uh, basically, that's your uh, 300 divided by 204 acres. So it's a very low uh, density. Uh, typical higher density tracks are more in the four to five units or houses per acre mark, so it's substantially less. Um, lot sizes and amount, uh, as mentioned before, we've got 100 foot wide lots um, and 80 foot wide lots of the two programs. Both are at 130 foot depth or a little bit deeper than your, your typical um, lot depth. Uh, we have twice as many basically 100 foot lots than we do 80s. Uh, so 201 total uh, 100 foot lots and 99 total um, 80 foot lots. House price range, uh, we're looking at house product from the 400s to about the 600s. Um, this is comparable to what is across the street in Laurel Heights Estates or the Reserve at Shirts 
This is basically kind of a phase into project um, from that project which is built out already uh, in terms of just the, the, the house product uh, and the price range and the bigger size lots. Uh, total park and open space acreage, as mentioned before, we have 43 uh, acres of parkland and then another 40 acres of open space, which equates to 84 acres total or 41% of the entire tract. Commercial, um, we have existing zone commercial corners, uh, 11.79 acres on I-10 and Greytown Road, and then another six acres on Bainig and Greytown Road. Uh, builder program. So we have not contracted the builders yet. We have, um, we have talked to them about this project and, and what we're proposing to do. Um, Kindred Homes, uh, which is formerly Wall Homes, this is the builder that's across the street in Laurel Heights. Uh, they're the kind of flagship builder in that program. Uh, they're um, interested in coming over, continuing that program using some of the same uh, product plans that they have over there and use them um, in our development. So um, we have Kindred Homes, David Weekly Homes, Monticello Homes, and Bel Air Homes. Um, these are more of your uh, semi-custom uh, builders as opposed to your national production builders which would not be part of this uh, development. Park plan details, uh, I know we already went over this, so I'll just go quickly. Uh, again, a 43-acre park. We have existing lakes that would kind of form the core of the park. Uh, we have a multi-use walking path, uh, tree plan, extensive landscaping, pavilion, playground, playscape, park benches, water fountain, restroom, and I, I forgot to put on here the parking lot. We are building the parking lot as well. Here's the park plan, as you saw before, with the uh, park amenities in the middle of the track between both um, lot pods, the 80-foot and the 100-foot pod, with access to the uh, park from both sides. Here is the um, improvement corner of the park, which shows your pavilion and playscape and your different improvements. Uh, I put together some uh, typical questions and concerns that um, we have uh, learned over the, uh, the past of doing this um, and want to kind of answer some of them. One being, you know, will house prices in Great Town Valley devalue my house in Laurel Heights Estates or the reserve at Shirt since it's right across the street? Um, as mentioned previously, uh, the house values or the, or the pricing of the houses are basically the same ranges uh, that are across the street in the 400s to the 600s. Um, so it's comparable to the existing homes in, in that community. Um, Kindred Homes would be one of the builders most likely in our community. Uh, and it's seeing Great Town Valley as a replacement community for Laurel Heights. Uh, will there be a sea of rooftops outside my back window? Uh, Great Town Valley has a net density of 1.47 dwelling units per acre, which as mentioned is a very low residential density and impact with a significant amount of open space, passive and active recreational amenities, and an eight-foot tall masonry fence abutting Greytown Road, which is part of your uh, code uh, against that thoroughfare. Um, the rezoning of the land can be considered a down zoning as the PDD designation allows for a less overall intense use than the current general business and manufacturing light zoning that exists uh, on the track right now. Uh, will new houses cause new traffic problems? Uh, we have multiple access points uh, on Greytown Valley, um, including locations on both Greytown Road and Bainig Road. Uh, per city code and TIA review, roads will be sized appropriately for proper circulation. Um, Greytown Road is to be widened uh, uh, according to the required improvements for construction of half of the ultimate width of the right of way on the property's frontage. Uh, that's, again, per your code. Uh, for that street, and obviously we'd be doing that as well. Um, and again, per your process, all the roads and classifications of the roads will be reviewed and approved by the city prior to any construction. And lastly, you put on here, Greytown Valley is a 10-year project with homes being built in stages per development phases. And the reason we want to put that on there is sometimes there's the misconception that all 300 homes or lots are going to be put on the ground at one time. And that's, that's simply not the case. We do them in bite size uh, units at a time. And so that's the reason for the gradual build out 
of the community over time. And then lastly, will new houses and improvements cause drainage issues to my property? Um, as mentioned before, Great Town Valley must do uh, pr uh, detention on site per the city code. That was the red areas um, that totaled approximately nine acres on the previous exhibit. Uh, under this detention scenario, no increased stormwater runoff will leave the site and pre-development or existing conditions for drainage are maintained. Um, basins will be sized appropriately at the platting stage and we have submitted a preliminary drainage report uh, to the city staff for their review. Um, and again, all drainage improvements will be reviewed and approved by the city prior to any construction. So between the detention and the drainage improvements within the units, um, we'd be accounting for any drainage issues. Um, that's everything I've got uh, on this presentation. And uh, if you'll have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, if you would um, stay around and we'll see if the commissioners have any questions. Uh, before I open it up for public comment, I'd just like to make a comment. I saw you taking pictures of the screen. Um, if you go to the city website, shirts.com, under government, agendas, P&Z, you, you can download the, uh, all the backup material that we saw, that we, that we get, that include, now it won't include this gentleman's presentation, but all the things that you saw Mr. Copley present you, you you can find there okay all right okay so at this time I'll open the public hearing anyone in the audience wishing to comment or ask questions uh, step forward and get to the microphone and please if you would um, state your name and address for the record uh, yes sir my name is Kevin Majors I live at 10320 Gage Cano and the reserves of shirts um, my main question, and I don't know if this is, uh, can be answered by you gentlemen, is um, right now we live in reserves of shirts and we just had a meeting a week or two ago with uh, a police uh, department representative and also public works. And we were told that from the police department that currently there's a shortage of police officers. And we was actually told that it's like a 15 minute to 30 minute response time to our service area for any type of non-emergency situation to go on within our community. We also don't have a lot of patrols going on in our community at this point in time as well. The public works individual said the same thing about the streets and uh, upkeeping of the streets and repairing of the streets, even though it's a, the, the part that we live in right now is the, the newest part. And we already have wavy streets that need to be addressed. And they were also saying that they have a shortage of funding and staff. With this new addition, how would that affect that overall uh, situation and scenario if you get more residents into the area and you already are having difficulty addressing what's, what's there right now and that's the, that's the, I don't know if that's a question you want to answer or you need to research but it's something I think that, that needs to be considered um, if you're going to get more people in uh, you're going to need more servicing from the police public works and whatnot yes sir all right thank you for your comments okay. um, we can't discuss um, but we can answer questions and very quickly yes the police department um, I don't really want to speak for them but you know for lack of a better term they have a they have they have trouble finding qualified uh, it's not that they don't have the positions it's finding the people to fill those positions and the city of as a whole you know we're we're, we're going through a big growth phase and you you won't find a department head that won't tell you they're understaffed and underfunded. City Council is aware of that. Um, the city has a, uh, embarked upon a structured plan, if you will, to try to catch up with some of the street maintenance. Um, but yes, thank you for your comments. They're, they're, they're very timely and appropriate, and that's one of the issues we deal with with growth. Yes, sir. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? No? Going once? Twice? Close the public hearing. Commissioners?
how they're uh, figuring out how to phrase them. Would you go back to your presentation, please, and back up a few slides on which one you left off with us? Which slide? Uh, it's the map. Go on back. Uh, back. Whoa. Back there. Whoop, whoop, whoop. You keep skipping it. There you go. Thank you. Now, I have a question. Yes, sir. You tell me up above in a table that we've got X number of 13,000 square foot lots. Yes. And then you give me a note down at the bottom that changes that number. Okay. And so the question is, yes. Where, where, where am I at? Are, are you asking the discrepancy between these numbers and this number? Uh huh. Okay. So, okay. The SF80 and the SF100 lot codes each have their established sizes. So, it's they're self-intuitive. The SF100 is the 100 foot wide ones. 80 SF80 is the 80 foot wide ones. So this point in orange here about the absolute minimum average lot size is for the entire subdivision of the whole. So that speaks to this requirement they have right above it that says that the, the development of Greytown must include at least 50% SF100 lots. So that means that at a bare minimum, you're getting 50% of the bigger lots, which would lead to a minimum average lot size total on the development as 11,700 square feet. You would, you would get to that by merging the two minimum overall areas here. That's at the bare minimum. Okay. I, I think right now it's what they have in their concept plan, it's like two to one is the average I think right now. But basically why this is in here uh, was the anticipated kind of uh, reasoning of well, what could we hold them to after this zoning? They have these two established lot codes that you see. Well, what am I seeing here? How many of each are, is gonna be actually developed in each unit? So while they have these planned in the conceptual plan for, oh, we're gonna have you know, two SF100 lots for every one SF80 lot, this kind of regulation establishes a minimum of the larger lot size that they would have to have. So it establishes a larger minimum average lot size. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I'm just following where this is going to fall because when we get this thing developed, 50% mm -hmm. of 300 lots is a different number than 200. Yes, 150. Yeah. Which we've been presented. As Those a conceptual are, plan. They're totally different numbers. So I'll, I'll tell you flatly right now, you should consider it based off the numbers I have right in front of you. You should consider it based off of the bare minimum that they're required to do because that's potentially all we could eventually hold them to which is why there's a, a stipulation here that 50% of them must be 100 feet wide. All right, now, now we have the truth on that one. All right, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> okay. I've, I've got some comments, some questions here. Yes. Once again, um, and, and you just pointed it out, we're dealing with concept versus what's actually going to be built. Mm -hmm. um, the only redeeming thing I saw is the same chart that you label conceptual, he labels master plan. Okay? I, I understand. Yep. Um, so... I have a, you know, there, there is an issue with why are we only, you know, when, he, when, when the developers already showed you that they have the potential of two-thirds of these lots being large lots, why did we go back to 50%? Why don't we just make that number two-thirds, okay? I mean, their, their conceptual plan, or, or, or maybe, you know, 60-40, I, you know, I'm just wondering why we want to drop it all the way to 50% when their their conceptual ideas already show them capable of doing so much more than that. Potentially. Yes. Okay. Um, and the I, I'm concerned about the uh, and and it's hard to tell from the 
uh, drawing. Um, right now, the current city zoning map has the I-10 frontage zone general business, all of it. Whereas the um, sector plan shows shows it being, um, I'm sorry, what is it? Real um, the the large yes, okay. So they've completely eliminated um, the general business zoning. I'm reluctant to allow residential zoning onto the interstate frontage. Okay. Now, given their their conceptual plan slash master plan, they're not going to do anything with that piece of property. In all likelihood, it's unbuildable. I, you know, I, so much of that is out there. Mm -hmm. But that's one of my concerns is allowing that frontage piece there, even as small as it is, to be anything other than commercial. Uh, I, I, I'm not real comfortable with that. Um, development signs for 10 years. You know, um, I, I had a question about that, but you answered it, that this, for, for the developer, this is a 10-year project. So they want to be able to have their development signs for 10 years. But, you know, if I go in there in year one or year two and I spend $600,000 for a house and I've got to look at these development signs for the next eight years, yeah, I don't know. So I think he has an answer for me. Sure. Do you want to answer the last one? You had a number of questions in there. Do you want me to answer a couple of the beginning ones? Well, the, uh, it was when I started talking about the development signs that I think I got his attention. Go for it. But yeah, if you've got if you've got some reply to what I just yeah, and, and the purpose of the development signs was was purely as a directional yeah. sign. So you're going to have model homes, and so you just kind of want to be able to di to direct people throughout the community. Um, we're not married to 10 years. Like I said, it could be a potential 10-year project, and that's the reason for the timeline of those signs. But again, it's not a hard and fixed deal. If we need mm -hmm. to back off of that, we're willing to do so. Um, again, that was the purpose of it. It's, it's to have you know, nice 4x8 metal signs that have the logo in the community and directionals of where to go, just so it reduces confusion okay. throughout the uh, community. But again, that's not something that we're necessarily married to in terms of the timeline. That's the ideal requested, but it's not the um, necessary. Well, I would understand as long as you're building and, and hopefully once you finish building this, you know, if you, so if, if this turns into a five or six year project, I wouldn't think you'd leave the signs laying around unused. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you showed us, and, and those, that photo you had of uh, Ashley Place, that was great. I mean, I think I understood it before then, but that, that picture kind of brought it home. So maybe what does a development sign look like? That, that, that might have been good. Um, and then again, my, my, my last question, I believe we now have, I think Sarah, Sarah San Antonio River Authority, that we now have wastewater in that area. So these, um, okay. But there's no more. We're not. There's, we're not doing septic out there anymore. Um, I'm sorry. No. I forgot to turn that that phone down. Um, okay. Um, I know there was something else. Oh, I have to ask. You you look familiar. You you, you you've done projects out here before, or or you, you, yeah. Okay. Our company has uh, managed projects before with insurance okay. uh, for clients. In this case, we are the actual developer for this track. Oh, okay. And that, so that's why that you, you didn't. None of them showed up on your list because you weren't really the. You were a consultant rather than. Yes, sir. Okay. Correct. Thanks. The manager as opposed to the owner. Gotcha. Um, and just to put my contrary hat on, like I do sometimes, um, it's. I, I get the whole math that if you've got 204 acres and you only build three houses, that, that's 1.47 units per acre, okay? But it really, you know, when, when you look at the, 
I got to tell you the big difference, and, I, and of course, I don't know what the homes across the street are selling for, okay? But the big difference between your development and their development is they're on half acre lots, okay? And your biggest lot, I think, is 0.3, or it, it's a little more, it's about 0.3. Yeah. Or 0.2, anyway, it's in there it's somewhere. Um, but ag again, you know, when I, when I look at the intent of the estate neighborhood PDD, this, this is kind of what they were, I think what they had in mind. Um, and you know, this 44 acre park sounds really nice and it is, but only because that's, you know, they can't do anything with it. It's in the flood zone. So they can't, you know, they can't build on it anyway. Um, so I'm a little, on one hand, I understand what we're doing here, uh, but as you said, um, we want to be careful how we apply this thing because theoretically, you know, let's say he had uh, 60 acres he couldn't build on. Well, okay, but now we allow him to, he could build much smaller lots. So, you know, we, we kind of have to be careful. And, and my other concern is that we're, we're going from 50% where, the, where the, 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 our goal is 50% undeveloped and we're dropping that to 49. Not a big drop. Um, and if I understood you right, the trade-off for that is bigger lots. If, 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 if we were to hold them to the 50%, then they can't squeeze in quite as many of the bigger lots. The other thing that bothered me and I'm sorry, I can't, I keep dragging my fire marshal experience up, but, you know, here we've got these huge lots, and looking at the little, um, and I understand they're just concept drawings down there in the corner where they show the houses. We take big lots and put giant houses on them, and so you're going to have them come in here, you know, why can't I put in a swimming pool? You know, I, it's... Um, unlike the neighbors across the street. So anyway, commissioners. Well, I'll go again, I'll follow some of yours. We spent a lot of money on the uh, sector plan and the uh, general plan for frontage all along I-10 and I-35. It's supposed to be all general business. Now we're cutting it down to a couple of corners. And I don't like it. I don't like housing on uh, highways. There, it's a, it's a problem. San Antonio is seeing it right now. They just had another one this morning. Killed, killed somebody. Uh, I hear it by Nacogdoches. So, uh, I would really like to see less housing on the frontage. And they won't be. 200 and was it 250? They had agreed or told us we we needed on the frontage for 10 or any one of the main highways. Uh, as far as the park, yeah, it it'll be a park until we get a heavy rain and it'll be underwater. That area has been heavy, heavy water for a long time. Eventually, you're going to get sewer. I don't know when, but right now it's just pump and haul. Eventually, and hopefully, it'll be shirts that provides it. Anyway. 
That's all I got, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Over here. I just had uh, two points of concern. Uh, as this gentleman over here was saying, is we're putting a lot of homes down in that neck of the woods in South Church, and we don't have the 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 people uh, as far as public services to take care of all of that. We do have a new station, you know, fire station three down there, but Church PD still has a quite a long time to get down there for just for routine calls. So that and a lot of rooftops in down there in South Church, and we're running out of commercial room to support all of that as far as I, what I'm seeing. So if we get rid of all the general business the houses down there, which they're look like houses, and, you know, but for business on the corner, are we going to put a, another dollar general down there for, for all those houses? What are we going to do with that down there? That's just my concern. But that is a valid question, sir. For, for on I-10, I guess partly what I could speak to is they're not doing anything necessarily different than what the sector plan is calling to. And we talk about how I-10 and I-35 are kind of grouped into this same category, but they're not nearly the same highway at all. Uh, you see most of this frontage, even this entire area, is floodplain. And realistically, what could necessarily go there? Designated as a state neighborhood, yes, it is a conceptual master plan, not necessarily a, a foolproof master plan that they would have to follow, but they have that extension of Ben Zingelman that has to go there. And realistically, there's not going to be any homes that would develop anywhere near that frontage, let alone the buffering, the walls that they'd have to do to even attempt something like put single-family residential homes on I-10. But they're not doing anything necessarily that would be different than the sector plan, just to offer that opinion. Is the APZ shown here? Yes. Eastern or the Western APZ? This is the Western, so they're not in between them. It's, this is the Western, then farther is the other APZ zone. Just making sure. Mm -hmm. So that we're like pretty close to 1604 at the edge of this map here, for another reference point. And, and realistically, well, number one, um, there have been a lot of discussion about the sector plan. Mm. In, in fact, over the wishes of PNZ, um, city council just amended it. Mm. So, uh, and, and personally, I, I, I think, uh, I'm not sure what we were doing when the sector plan just clusters as these little corner um, areas of, of commercial. You know, I disagree with you, Nick, about Interstate 10. I've lived in shirts a long time, and I've always maintained the issue with Interstate 10, especially now that we're seeing these rooftops, has always been the lack of wastewater services. Water's not an issue. Shirts has provided water down there for years, but you, you know, you can't build uh, a shopping mall, you can't build a distribution center, you can't build a movie theater on septic systems. Uh, and I honestly believe that when Sarah and um, CCMA through shirts uh, finally are able to provide wastewater services to that frontage, um, you'll see some growth out there. It, 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 will, um, it, it will turn into something. Now, realistically, the, the, the small little chunk of general business that uh, we're doing away with here probably isn't significant. Um, I think what we'll end up with is a gap. You know, there'll be, you know, there'll be that little piece of property, although I guess there's nothing that precludes in the future somebody, somebody replatting and, and rezoning a, a piece of a PDD. As long as it still met the density and open space requirements of the originally established PDD, they could do that, but I don't oh, think they'd be able to. We're basically tying our hands forever and anon by approving this PDD with that chunk of frontage as being in the PDD. There can never ever be anything in there other than what's in their PDD. Without amending the PDD, sure. Okay. And again, to clarify, I, I wish we had a, a police department because I, you know, I've been retired almost six years now. Uh, 
But when last I looked, um, police response uh, to Southwestern shirts isn't necessarily a, 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 a problem unique to your area. Last time I looked, the police department had shirts divided into, I think it was five patrol zones. And the idea it w was to have an officer in each, at least one officer in each zone. Now, I don't know what their current staffing is, but that's a minimum of, of five people. Now, I can tell you from fire department experience, yes, they just opened a brand new fire station a little further away than I would have liked. I, you know, we were originally were going to build it closer. But even people in central shirts, you know, these people that live right across the street and the fire station's right over here, it's the luck of the draw, okay? And what I'm talking about is you have an issue across the street and you dial 911, that engine may not be there. It could be out on another call. And now you've got to wait from, for one to come from south or north. And it's the same is true with police protection. You know, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's Chief Hansen's intent to have at least one officer in this part of the city. But if there's a major accident or a robbery or any call that requires backup, that officer may not be there, okay? Um, and, and I don't know if we'll ever get to the point um, in any of the emergency services that we can guarantee you that there will be somebody there. It's just the way, uh, you know, San Antonio, I don't know, they've got thousands of police officers and it, it might be a little bit easier for them. Um, but, but that's the real issue, uh, as spread out as we are, and we're always talking about that weird shape of the city. How do you get from here to there and, you know, all this kind of thing. Um, we're all aware of that. Um, so those were my concerns. I, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about only requiring 50% large lots. I'm a little concerned about, you know, doing away with that little chunk of general business zoning. Um, and um, now, see, I've already forgotten the third one. So, okay. Anyone have anything else? Yes, sir. Nick, can you pull up the zoning exhibit map? This one? No. No. The one, the one we had in our packet. Oh, I think it's on David. This one? Because I didn't have all the other stuff. Uh, no, go back a couple. It's the zoning exhibit. This, this is the zoning exhibit. Labeled down here, mess front. This is the. <laughs> All right. Uh, so what what is the plan for that little piece of land that that joins up with the frontage road? That little odd shaped piece of land. What's the plan for that? It's currently open space. I think it's mostly entirely in the floodplain. Completely in the floodplain. O open space with one gigantic subdivision sign, I imagine. <laughs> okay. The corn. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? She's, it's from the from FEMA's website. The hundred-year floodplain. FEMA's definition of floodplain boundary. Okay, so there, there on the on that exhibit, there is a there's a layout for Ben Zingleman Road. Yes. Will the developer be responsible for constructing that as a 90-foot right-of-way arterial? Yes. Will it dead end on Greytown, or does it go farther east? I believe that's where it stops. That's where it's going to stop. So, so that that is a floodplain right there. So, will this be at grade, or will we, will you as a developer build some sort of a a bridge or something to get through the floodplain? I, and I I don't expect to see a low water crossing. I expect to see something better than that.
So from a city standpoint, what do we want there? Do we want a low water crossing or do we want some sort of a bridge? So just to remind the commission, this is a zoning case. It's not a subdivision plat. Uh, the city has regulations in our public works manual uh, in the UDC that stipulates uh, the, it's um, the right term, the relative elevation of roads to the floodplain. Um, and so again, part of that is with our drainage ordinances, and I cannot remember if it's a, we can get back to you, if it's a 10 year event, the level of water uh, that gets up to the road. So certainly, if the developer was required to build it, they would have to build it to comply with our UDC standards. Uh, I will say this, though, that yeah, in all likelihood, they're not going to have to build the roadway because of rough proportionality. We would get a right-of-way dedication to preserve that, uh, and it would be built at some point in the future. But again, uh, all, a lot of the questions you guys are asking, they haven't done yet, because if you don't approve the zoning, it would have been wasted money to have to have done all that design work to not get the zoning to be able to do anything with it. So, so to be clear, as I recall, we can get you a definite answer next time. Our roads do not have to be out of the hundred-year floodplain. They part of it is they convey rain events, and yeah, there are points, and I forget what the year is, that it tops the curb. But it varies from road to road. So we can get you that answer. So we'll expect to get a right-of-way dedication, but not an actual road. So let me say this. You're asking a question that's tied to platting. So I'm not going to give you a definite answer tonight that, gets, that creates a false expectation or creates an issue for the city in the future. Well, if, a, a, on the flip side of that, if, if, if in my judgment I don't think there's adequate transportation in there, I'm not willing to vote for a sure. zoning change. You, you can certainly do that, yeah. If you feel there's not adequate transportation, you can certainly recommend denial of it going forward, um, going to city council. The, the issue we've got is is that that I would, I believe, you certainly disagree, have a different opinion, is that when you look at a zoning, you look at the ultimate state in the ultimate plans with regard to the thoroughfare plan and um, the water and sewer master plan and the parks plan. And you make a decision as to whether or not the zoning is appropriate in light of those master plans, in light of that ultimate built condition. Because what you want to avoid is a zoning that will always have a problem due to a lack of infrastructure because we didn't plan for enough of it. The timing of development in, in the timing of the in infrastructure is a function of our UDC and the subdivision ordinance platting process and is a function of the criteria we lay out for a traffic impact analysis study that stipulates when you build, how much do you have to accommodate going forward. Uh, I will say this, that with regard to the Ben Zingelman extension, that is one of those roads that, in my opinion, once most of us are dead, certainly sooner for some of us than others, um, there will be people here saying, wow, look how far up everything's developed. New Berlin is like New Braunfels. You know, Marion is like San Marcos. At some point, we are in that condition. And, and that is a road that ultimately, I think, based on the, the city doing the thoroughfare plan update, which you guys participated in, that road is likely going to be needed to convey regional traffic. And Zingelman isn't needed to convey traffic from their development. It's something that we need to convey traffic for miles and miles and miles. I would probably equate it to a Wurzbach Parkway as a good example, you know, Wurzbach used to stop at whatever Lock Hill Selma or something and head it off to the medical center. And then now you can basically take it over with a limited access all the way up to 35. That is what I kind of relate ben, the Ben Zingelman extension to. So again, 
when they come in for the development, when we see the phasing plan, they will submit a TIA. We will do the rough proportionality analysis and, and make those decisions as to what needs to be built and what gets deferred. But yeah, there's no reason to build Ben Zingelman now. It, it goes nowhere, continues nowhere, it sits over floodplain. It would deteriorate before anybody drove on it. Um, so really, I think the appropriate thing is right-of-way preservation, which allows it to happen in the future. And then again, based on what we tend to hear from the residents out in this vicinity, it's making improvements to Greytown. So I think that's really the basket we're going to put our eggs in is Greytown and Bainig um, to certainly for the city then step in and kind of fill in. And I think, you know, some of the concerns, and I agree, they're, they're certainly valid about the, the traffic in the area, Bainig, Greytown, certainly with, with PD protection and fire response times, you know, to some degree, and I tend to give you a direct answer, you may not always like it, but when the Laura Heights development was built, it was way, way out, pretty much on the edge of the world. And, and I think that's why a lot of residents bought out there. It's kind of convenient. You can get to San Antonio pretty easy. You can get to skiing pretty easy. Get up in shirts pretty easy. But most folks that I've talked to moved out there because they didn't want to live in this area of shirts. And part of what comes with that are a couple things. One is it's when you're out there kind of by yourself, and as more development happens, it gets better. Response times are going to be longer. There are just fewer people out there. There's less infrastructure. It's why we don't have as many parks. PD response isn't what it is. We're working on fire. Um, and, and to some degree, we're dealing with rural roads that serve multiple different cities, and that's been adjusted some with the San Antonio Converse boundary adjustment. But it's multiple different cities have roads out there that were rural roads. And again, folks don't often like it, but it, for it to get better, it, it sort of has to get worse. You know, we've heard that from residents about old Wiederstein. And again, until you get the development that kind of makes the situation worse, it, it just doesn't rise to the level of priority to get improved. And so that's a bit of the good and bad you get with new development. With new development, you get more truck traffic out there building it, you get more residential traffic, and that kind of makes it worse, but you get roadway impact fees, you get roads built as part of the development, and now you have more folks out there to say, hey, instead of there being 500 homes in the area, there are 700, 800 homes in the area, thus helping support and fund additional police officers and warranting that presence down in that area because there's that population for it. So um, that's a really long-winded answer to your question. I can certainly appreciate it. I can certainly appreciate what's going to happen with this. I think it will likely, as, as, as was said, it will be a right-of-way dedication. There will not be it built, again, as a staff person, and again, we'll deal with this when it comes to it. We're going to want improvements made to Bainted and Greytown. To me, the biggest issue are how we get Greytown, with the res coming in first, improved all the way up to I-10, and then how we make that little corner around the commercial piece with Bainig, and likely that's something that we would sit down and say, can we make a deal with regard to the roadway impact fees we are collecting, and now we've made it better for the residents moving out there, the residents that are out there now, because you get more roads that are built, and we're not having somebody sitting up here 40, 50 years going, what were they thinking, not preserving, you know, the need for this Ben Zingelman, because we all think it's crazy, it'll never happen, it's never going to be needed. But again, I've told the story about Wurzbach Parkway. I've told the story about the Bandera Road flyover. I've told the story about learning to drive on 1604. You know, it, it's just the world changes. Very different than what it was. A lot of folks probably cannot believe shirts is what it is today, given what it was years ago. So, Part of the original concern, and, and you're absolutely correct, that we, you know, this is a zoning case, not a plat. But during the planning process, if Ben Zangelman is on our master develop our master thoroughfare plan, then it will be that'll be a requirement in the planning planning process, correct? Sure, that's right. So what we will do is when the plats come in, and likely before, because likely what we'll do is sit down and say, All right, what's the phasing of it gonna be? Go through it and we'll we'll map that out. And so likely on the front end we would reach an understanding, perhaps even codify that through a uh, roadway impact fee uh, reimbursement agreement with regard to the use of the credits or subdivision improvement agreement. We would kind of lay that deal out. Uh, 
to, to really probably identify on the front end. It's a right away dedication for Ben Zingelman and then here's what we get built. So yeah, that is something that we would do at the start of the planning process, not only so that we can look at a big picture, but also so that they can kind of finance the deal and, and cash flow it, um, you know, coming in. But I can tell you, a big concern on this one's going to be, how do we make that connection from Greytown to, to I-10? Because frankly, all the construction traffic is going to come that way. A lot of the residents are going to head that way. To have that gap in that road would be hugely problematic. Like, valid concern. I, I appreciate the explanation. You, you forgot to add Lazar Parkway into that. Ben Zingelman may end up being a Lazar Parkway. It, it may very well. And so, so let me come back and offer this. Lazar Parkway was on there prior to us updating the, the comp plan. And prior to us looking at that and saying, do we need this extra road? And so I don't disagree. It's problematic to have roads that are unnecessary on your thoroughfare plan. You, you don't want to over plan for them. It is a much, much more significant problem to underplan for roads because, and not that it can't be done and not that it isn't done, but it is, it is very difficult and hugely expensive to try to come back in and add roads. And so again, I think we try to say, let's be conservative, um, but let's not miss opportunities um, because we tend to think of shirts, and I think this is common, I'm not, not, I mean, myself, I have to check myself. We think of shirts as it was, maybe not even as it is, but it's even harder to think of it how it's going to be 10, 20, 30 years down, down the way um, for, for what it's worth. And, and so again, yeah, it could be a Lazar Parkway, but, but the flip side could be, and again, I'll point this out, they have a huge problem on 78. It's a, it's a mess. It's a mess because of the connectivity north-south. When there's a train coming through there, it's hugely problematic. As, as the chairperson knows, we one of the scenarios we thought about for emergency response is what happens if there's a train derailment or some sort of issue there. We've really kind of cut half the city off. And so, again, I would go back and say it's comparable to the 3009 we need more than one connection to Southern Shirts, which is literally what we've got, and right now that's offset with 1518. And, and so, you're right, somebody may look up going, yep, turns out we don't need it, but I think it's more likely somebody sits here 30, 40, 50 years from now and says, wow, that's really good that they preserve that, and it becomes this big project with, um, you know, Alamo Area Metropolitan Planning Organization with TxDOT, coming in and building that connection as you've seen around the, the region. A couple more things. Mm -hmm. I forgot what happened along the Greytown Road and the reserve. Did the reserve improve half of Greytown Road? I don't believe they did. And again, this is a bit, and I know there was conversation about the lot size and the number of units and things like that. It's a bit mixed bag. You get fewer lots, there's less impact on the road system and it tends to be less improvement made. I don't think they made any improvements to the adjacent road. They did right away dedication, maybe a diesel lane or something, but very little improvements were made and, and that has to do with that low low density level. But, but in this development, the developer is gonna do half of their portion of Greytown? So let me back up. Per the UDC, straight from what it says, the developer is required to dedicate right-of-way and construct half of the roads that are on the perimeter. So half of Bainig where adjacent, half of Greytown where adjacent. Any road that comes through the property, they have to build the full width. So again, the, in any road that's adjacent, they would make improvements with the exception of an FM roadway or a state roadway. That's what the UDC says. Now, a couple things happen. One is, they do a traffic impact analysis. That TIA may trigger additional improvements to be built because of the impact that they have. And they could be a particular point, such as improving an intersection, adding signalization, decel lanes, things like that. So it could require more than that. We also run, using our roadway impact fee ordinance, a rough proportionality analysis. And at that point, a couple of things have to happen. One is if they 
haven't built enough road to cover their impact, they get credits for some of the development. They would then have to pay a roadway impact fee for the other portion. Or we do an agreement where they construct a portion they're not required to, but we all view as beneficial in lieu of doing that. Helps them market the development, makes it easier for folks to get in and out, makes it better for the existing residents, everything like that. The flip side is, or we do, um, if they have built too much, a reimbursement agreement. Now, if they build so much more they're required to on the front end, even doing a reimbursement agreement becomes problematic, which is likely what we would have with the Ben Zingelman extension and the fact that I don't really need the road now and likely won't need it for another 10, 15, 20 years. And, and so, again, I anticipate us focusing that. So that's how we determine which roads are built. So per the UDC, they build half of the roads adjacent to what's being platted. And, and, and that's how it works. But then there's the TIA and then there's a rough proportion analysis that you tack onto that. Maybe I'll continue outside of the meeting, but okay, thank you for that. <laughs> when, clarify something for me. Sure. When, when the parks board accepts the concept for the parks in here, park space in here, is that binding? Is, it, is that set in stone, or do we have to approve this, this PDD before that parkland gets formally accepted? Wow. Uh, you probably are bringing up stuff we've never hit. Let me, here's, here's let, me, let me try to give no, you. No, let me tell you why I'm okay. asking it. I'm asking it because <laughs> does the parks, does parks understand what they're biting off over here? We, we can't take care of what we have now. How are we going to take care of this? Sure. So and, 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 the, and the parks barn is in this general area. This is as far away as you can get from the center of the city to come out and do maintenance and stuff. It takes half a day to get there. Sure. So to answer that, the, what the code says is that we cannot accept parkland unless the parks board recommends that we do so. So it's the opposite of what you asked. We can't take it unless parks board says yes. Um, in theory, I guess you could write a PDD that bypasses Parks Board, but technically per the code, Parks Board has to recommend approval. All of that is predicated on the fact that the project really has to go forward and the developer has to trigger the requirements. The way the code works is the staff gets to dictate whether they want land or cash uh, from that. So certainly I would say this, that um, if staff discovered something about this property that was unbeknownst to us at this time. You know, there's some sort of environmental issue. You know, things have been dumped there. There's a, there's a cemetery on the whole thing, whatever. We would not take it at that point. We revert saying, hey, we didn't have this information going forward. So, so that's the answer. If the developer doesn't move forward with the project, then there's no park there. Again, I don't like to put words in people's mouth or speak for people, but generally the discussion at Parks Board centered on the fact that we don't have any parks right now in the reserve or in Laura Heights. It's this low density area. We will not have parks that meet our normal standard in this area because of the low density. So they viewed this as the large, really regional park that serves a much larger area is how they view it. Um, so yeah, I think they understood what they were biting off onto and they in fact liked the fact that they were getting a very large park that will serve a very large area that's generally more efficient to maintain than a lot of these small little pocket parks we have scattered around the community. But the same issue applies here. When we have development that's on the edge of our city limits that isn't contiguous, it means, yeah, we've got this long haul to get out there to provide services, which is, I think, why the residents spoke about police and things like that. Um, again, even not to speak for public works, but they certainly get more comments about streets right up in this area because they drive past them every day than they do down south. I mean, that's part of it. We kind of rely on the residents to call us up and say, hey, you got a problem. We try to get out and deal with it. So, yeah, you're probably going to have some of this. But again, I will say the same thing, and I think the Parks Board thought this is. If we don't get 
parkland now, we, we may never have a park in this area, which means forever we have people coming out going, why is there no park in our part of town? You've got 26 throughout the rest of the community. You've got 20 of them through central shirts. But, you know, right now we've got uh, the, the Rhine Valley Park. We've got Heritage Oaks Park. We've got Crescent Bend, which is a different kind of nature park. That's all we've got on Southern Shirts, three of the 26. We'll have the Halley's Cove, which is really sort of a trailhead to the linear, you know, along the, the um, Womanhawan Creek. And this, frankly, would be the park that likely would serve this big part of Southern Shirts. This, this would be it. And that, I think, was what they actually liked about it, in my opinion. I think is that this is, this is going to be a 10-year development, so a lot can change in 10 years. But, you know, what I'm seeing, and unless the Parks Department gets a lot more staff and a lot more money and a lot more equipment, you know, you, you could be living in a $650,000 house out here and look out your back window and see nothing but overgrown brush and unkept parkland. So sure you could. We, we as a community. I, I, would, I would expect paying 650 for a house. I would expect to have a postcard park out there. And, and with our resources like we have now, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, Commissioner. I mean, again, and, and I'll be kind of clear, and I would encourage folks to listen. You have to listen because video didn't work. Last night's council meeting, you know, it's a, it's a balancing act. We have folks moving in, buying a $600,000 house in our community. We've also got folks buying $60,000, $80,000 houses in our community, and I think a lot of the discussion at council seemed to center on needing to be aware that we have that range. But yeah, the reality is we don't go in and put in million dollar parks like other communities do around us. It was funny, I, and I can't remember which park in New Braunfels they made the comparison to for this, but I think it was Fisher Park, but said, well, just to be clear, don't set the bar there because yeah, we don't have that funding level to do that sort of thing going forward. And so you're right, it's about what do we want as a community? What are we willing to, to pay for as a community? Um, I can appreciate the comments. I think staff deals with that every day. I think council hears about that. I think we've tried to be more thoughtful about what we accept. You know, we, we have a number of parcels. We probably have a half dozen that, that we took that were little leftover kind of pieces that serve no purpose and they're just that, they're a maintenance issue. I think We've had a lot of discussions about how many parks we can have, and the push on this one from Parks Board was it's much more efficient to go a big regional park. But just to be clear, it's going to be very much in its natural state. It'll have a small pocket that's developed, but otherwise this is a place you come out to sort of hike and walk around, much like Crescent Bend. Um, again, maybe do something with the ponds on it, uh, much like we've got at the Heritage Oaks Park. I've got one more, I promise one more. In our UDC, oh, I don't have page numbers. In the Estate Neighborhood Plan Development District, 21513, in there it talks about designated open space must be restricted from further development by a permanent conservation easement <coughs> running with the land or other similar legal instrument. Sure, and so what you've got here will be either parkland dedication or what we choose not to take as park, the conversations have centered around because they are drainage easements and those drainage easements restrict that and permanently ensure that's the case. And, and that's really been the dialogue on this is what we take versus what we don't. What we don't take is because we don't want to pick up the maintenance of these necessarily some of the drainage features, but the easements associated with that achieve that purpose. So, so this giant open space that we've that we may accept as park space, is that the other similar legal instrument? Sure. Yeah. In in, in, in absence of a conservation easement. Th that's right. Okay. You know, and and, and maybe let me say this a, a little bit too, and I can certainly appreciate. And, and it sounds like you've listened to staff over the years of, look, unless it's tied into the zoning, it's not tied into the zoning. 
Um, but I think there is a bit of a balance that we try to seek with these on these developments. Um, what we found is, is that a bit of flexibility, a bit, allows the developer to do a couple things. One is respond to market conditions because what people are looking for in a house right now is probably not exactly what they're looking for 10 years from now. And the trends in residential development now may not be that case in the future. Golf course is the best for a while. That was the big thing. We certainly had our, our golf course as well. Popularity waned and that became an issue. You see that even with pools. Lots of neighborhood had pools. Now a lot of people have pools in their backyards and neighborhood pools, they're still there, but, but not as often. And, and so partly you wanna build flexibility, partly because when they come in with the engineering work, it creates issues. We have had to come back on, I, I don't know how many big PDDs to say, all right, well, we got there, we're short two feet, or we're short this, we gotta tweak this, we have to tweak that. And so I think part of this is to build in a little bit of, bit of flexibility with the comfort level, knowing that it does not serve the developer to be, to continue to own and have to maintain a lot of floodplain and then pay parkland dedication cash. That would likely kill the deal. So it's, it's really something that they need to happen as well, which is in part why staff's not concerned, but we feel like we have those constraints. And that's a bit of what I think the thing is with the lot size and the fact that they've shown one thing, but the ordinance ties in another is, you know, they, how long have they been in on this one? This is on about maybe a year maybe. And when did y'all first show up on this project that we had a commerce? Yeah, it's been several years. And so the one thing to understand is that we go through a lot of round and round and a lot of them muttering under their breath probably as they leave meetings of staff is da 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 da. And, and one of the things that we try to do, which is maybe why when you ask the question, well, we see this plan, this concept plan that has this many lots and we're willing, is, is that's frankly part of how we try to get to something that we feel is a win-win. From a staff perspective, we feel like what's listed in that criteria in terms of those number of large lots meets the intent. And if that were to develop, we feel like we've got a really good development that adds to shirts that consistent with the comp plan. Um, that by doing that, likely we'll have more bigger lots than that. But what we didn't necessarily feel the need to do is that this is a bad development unless we get that many lots. And so part of it is in trying to work with the developers, what we don't want them to think is, man, if I put something down on paper, they're gonna hold me to that even though that may not be viable. And I think that's how we approach this. It's a layout that sort of works. But as Nick said, very clear, and I think it was always the intent, wasn't somehow come out, you need to understand that this is what it could be. We feel like even with that, it's a really good project. We think as they go in and they look at, you know, easement locations and things like that, they're gonna start to lose. They may have some lot shrink down. Again, we just dealt with a case today in SDR that literally is supposed to have a drainage easement in the back. Solution is, do we have that drainage easement run across the back of the lots? Well, that's a really bad thing in some way, or do we put it right outside the fence? If you looked at an aerial, it appears to be the exact same things, but technically it affects the zoning. Those are the sort of reasons that we build in this flexibility, understanding that, yeah, if they met that minimum, we still think we've got a really good project, particularly that we've got a project, and, and I think everybody really likes the Laurel Heights and Reserve, and it's great, and you know, but we've heard y'all talk a lot about the fact that the first phases were on septic and that that was an issue and that that was a factor. And we've heard from residents, we don't have a park. Where do our kids go play? What can we do? Whatever. This is a regional park, it's not in their neighborhood. It's right across the street. Thus, we came up with a plan and staff's recommending approval of it consistent with the, the comp plan. And the last thing I'd say with regard to the zoning is we made a conscious decision not to go in and do city initiated rezonings. We would deal with the comp plan, lay out the vision that we wanted, and then work with property owners as they come in as opposed to deal with that fight of, we're gonna show up and we're gonna tell you we're gonna do city initiated rezones. Doesn't mean we don't have some that bite us on occasion, but it's generally worked out. So. I'm still puzzled as to why it, why it talks only about a conservation easement and it doesn't mention anything about parkland. So, so the reason, well, we would, and I, I'm just asking, is is our UDC missing something? Sure. Yes. Or, our, or does our, or does this just 
Yeah, it fits in. So, no, the, the, the intent with regard to a conservation easement and the reason you have that is what we don't want to do is, and again, keep in mind that prior to about eight years ago, we kind of did straight zoning on stuff mostly, not too many PDDs. We developed this sort of concept. The reason there's the language for the conservation easement is what you don't want to do is have a project come in, particularly on straight zoning, and or not have the plan locked in, and then five years later somebody shows up and says, we're going to, to develop this for lots. Um, the project off 1518 that they had the little addition to come in, the one that splits between us and Selma, um, Next to Orchard Park, um, you may remember. Remember, we had the little the development that was there, and then they came in, they reclaimed some floodplain, and they they were doing about a dozen lots. I'm looking for some help here. None of this rings a bell. Okay, I'm I'm talking to myself. Again, it was an issue that the initial zoning was was straight zoning. They had a part that they couldn't develop because it was floodplain. When Deeds Creek went in pulled out and they came in with about a dozen, they had trees, we had a lot of residents showing up saying, we missed the trees, We're, we don't have parkland, why couldn't they preserve it? There's nothing we can do about it. That's why you have this conservation easement. You have a conservation easement to ensure that it stays as open space. And I would say this, and this is where the code needs to be updated, unless you have some mechanism to do so. In this case, we, we have the ability to get the parkland um, to, to ensure that that happens. And then again, the issue we've really had is there are going to be drainage easements on it that are going to preclude that as well. What we don't want to do is take some high and dry land and they say, oh, yeah, yeah, that'll be open space. It'll, it'll be fine. We'll meet the requirement. And then seven years later, they're back in trying to do something with it. And so you're right. Part of it is, again, assuming knock on wood. Well, actually, council approved the budget last night. So uh, we'll get to kick off with you guys a UDC and a comp plan update. And we can tweak language like that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. James. Um, I just wanted to throw out there for the residents where we were talking about Lazaro Parkway. If you're not familiar with that, you, you under, that's that looks like a drainage thing that runs through. Yeah, that, at one time that was going to be a roadway. So that's what they were talking about. Commissioners, any more discussion, questions? What do we want to recommend to City Council? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we recommend approval of PC, correction, ZC 2020-006 to the City Council. Thank you, sir. I have a motion from Commissioner Autumn to recommend approval to City I'll Council. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a second from Commissioner Ray. Any further discussion or questions? Call for the vote. Aye. No. No. Aye. Aye. No. Aye. All right, so I've lost track. How many no's did we have? Three. Okay. Motion passes four to three for a recommendation of approval to city council. And do you folks need some rationale for the nay votes? If you would, uh, Commissioner Broad. Uh, 
the requirement listed in UDC 21513F2A was not met was not met uh, regarding the minimum 50% of the gross total acreage, so on and so forth. Commissioner Greenwald. And Commissioner Evans? I uh, do not agree with the uh, signage issue. There are too many other loose ends for me that uh, need clarification. And I think City Council will expect a little more detail, and we don't have it. All right. Thank you, sir. That's sufficient for the record? Okay. All right. Moving on, item six, requests and announcements. Request by commissioners to place items on a future planning and zoning agenda. Anything? All right, item B, announcements by commissioners. Anyone have anything? Item C, announcements by city staff. Nothing from them either. All right, there being no further business for this commission, this meeting is adjourned.